فلله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فلا يجر إلا نفسه فقال عز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال عز وجل إنا نحن نزلنا الذكر وإن نلغون حافظون أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأبدة من لساني يفكه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورثنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورثنا اجتنابا اللهم الحمني رشد وعزني من شر نفسي Today I have a very important conversation or a monologue with you all and it is a discovery that has happened in the last two three months that is probably the biggest discovery of maybe the last 500 years. In fact, if Muslims knew about what I'm going to talk about, we would be celebrating quite vehemently, quite furiously. And so I'm going to talk about this discovery, and I'm going to share some aspects of this discovery. What has happened is, and I'll explain this in detail. They have found about 18 fragments of the Quran worth almost one juz of the Quran, meaning the total fragments is equal to almost 140, 150 verses of the Quran. These fragments, they were found in the University of Birmingham. University of Oxford did carbon dating. I will explain carbon dating in a second. And they found that these fragments of the Qur'an, they go back to the time of the Prophet Now this is very significant because the Qur'ans that we have up till now, the oldest ones, they go back to the time of Uthman. So therefore, you know, the Orientalists, they don't look at that uh, if somebody is in Russia, he's reading Qur'an, and his Qur'an is the same one, same as the one who's reading Qur'an in America is the same. They're not concerned with this. Because obviously, if there was some deviance or variants of Qur'an or versions of Qur'an, they would have become some group that reads Qur'an differently. And also the Western scholars, they have been confused because of the different qiraas, which has to do with the alif, ya, and the wow, basically the reading of the vowels. Like, kalla inna l-insana la yatwa, kalla inna l-insana la yatwi, ara'a mustaghna, ara'a mustaghni. The words are the same. Just how you're reading the ya or not reading the ya is the only difference. So the different qiraas, the different harf have confused a lot of Western scholars. So, basically what they have said, the Western scholars, now there's two groups and there have been two responses to the Qur'an and I don't know if you are all aware of this or not and I'll go into some details about this maybe later on but there have been two general you know, whether you study Matsuki or Watt or Bell or Sale or any of the Orientalists even if you study Edward Said who was an Arab Christian who was very much pro-Muslim especially in regards to the Palestinian issue uh, if you study any of the Orientalists, their general point is that we know that, okay, Uthman had a script, but Uthman made a script because why? Because there were differences, people were writing differently. So his, their concern has been that, okay, since they were writing Quran differently, therefore there were some differences, is the basic summary of what people have said about Uthman trying to standardize the Qur'an. There, that happened because, because of differences or the possibility of differences occurring 
Therefore, he burnt all the Qur'ans, made a standard of Qur'an, which is a misunderstanding even amongst Muslims. This is what Muslims think happened. And Muslims, when they explain that what, why Uthman gathered the copy of the Qur'an, this is what they say. That the Qur'an was being written differently, so in order to preserve it, we made one standard Qur'an. So this happened about 25 years after the Prophet. So since there were other versions, who knows what was right? I don't want to go into details, but Ibn Mas'ud one, because Zayd ibn Sabit is the one who wrote the standard, helped, who was in charge of writing the standard Qur'an of the copy of Uthman one. But Ibn Mas'ud one disagreed with Zayd ibn Sabit on how the certain verses would be written. What does that mean? What does it mean that they disagreed on how certain verses would be written? It means they disagreed on how the Qur'an would be. So, what I want to share with you before I go into the details of this. So they found these fragments. I'll answer these questions that I've raised. But I wanted to share with you the two general responses is that, okay, Uthman made a standard copy, and since then it's been basically the same. But we know that there must have been some differences in the beginning. And also, there were no dots in the Qur'an. Also, the arrangement, they, most of the Orientalists would say, the arrangement of the surahs was not given by the Prophet ﷺ, meaning which surah came first, which surah came second. They kind of like just compiled it all together and it just became whatever it became. And there was no real sequence given by the Prophet ﷺ to these surahs. This is what most of the academic scholars of Islam would say in the universities. However, Christians have a very, the Christians, the hardcore Christians, particularly the missionaries amongst the Christians, they have a very, very different response. Their response is Prophet Muhammad was epilep uh, he had epilepsy. So he would have these seizures and he would think he's having revelation, but he would not be having revelation, he's just having epilepsy. This is the gist of what Christian missionaries teach and are taught. So these are the two responses, one from the university, one from the Christian missionaries. So this has been going on, and as a whole, from the time of Montgomery Watt, about 200 years ago, to till today, more or less scholarship has been leaning towards, for a very long time, has been, over the years, has been leaning to the fact that yes, the Qur'an that we have today is pretty much the same that Prophet Muhammad had But now, there is conclusive evidence. It's empirical evidence. It is carbon dated manuscripts. It is, it cannot, there, you cannot think of anything more verifiable than what has happened in the University of Birmingham. Let me give you the history of what has happened. There was a <clears throat> there was a professor. His name was his name was. His last name was Mingana. This professor, his name was Mingana. He was an Iraqi in 1937. He was a Christian in Iraq. He was, he had some relationship with the Cadbury family. I don't know if you know what the Cadbury family is, but they have a very big chocolate factory. They have a very big chocolate business. Cadbury is a very big brand in chocolate making. So in 1937, Mingana, having a relationship with this family, said, I need some money, about two million dollars, it seems. I need to prove what he wanted to prove, this professor. He wanted to prove that the Quran is not based on Arabic, it is based upon another language called Syriac. You know, these are all Semitic languages, Hebrew, Syriac, Chaldean, Arabic, Assyrian, these are similar languages. 
It is true probably that at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, anyone who knew Arabic probably also understood Syria. Just like, you know, nowadays, if you know Urdu, you'll know some Farsi, just by knowing Urdu. And if you know some Urdu by nature, you also know some Arabic. It's just part of it. But these were languages that were spoken in that region. Syriac, Chaldean, Assyrian, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic. These are all sister languages. And if you understand one, chances are you'll understand a big portion of the other. Now, Mingana wanted to prove that the Qur'an is not based on Arabic, but that rather the Qur'an is based on Syriac, which is spoken by Christians in Iraq. So he got the funds from this family and he started purchasing manuscripts in Iraq. You know, Iraq was the place of Islamic civilization. This is where Baghdad was, this is where the Abbasid Empire was, this is where a lot of Islamic history has to do with this area of Iraq. So he started buying out, and by the way, I don't know if you know this, there are more original manuscripts of Islamic works now in the Western universities than they are in the Muslim universities. For example, the original copy of Abu Dawud, Sunan Abu Dawud, one of the six books of Hadith. Abu Dawud is not in the Muslim world, it's in Germany. I don't want to go into this, but this is a big tragedy in a way that we are, we are losing the original manuscripts of our own tradition. Others are paying millions of dollars for one copy of a book. But anyway, this guy, he paid, he got $2 million, and he got a bunch of manuscripts, and this collection had many different books, including many different Qur'ans, and it was called the Mingana Collection, which is in the archive of Birmingham University. If you go to Birmingham University, uh, archive of manuscripts, you'll find many manuscripts that they have in the archive. You can download the archives and look at the manuscripts. Read. They have books there that we have never heard of. Now, having said that, so this happened in 1937. So, there was a PhD student. Her name was Alba Fadili. She was doing her PhD on early Quranic manuscripts. So she was looking through the Mangana collection, that collection that he had brought. She was looking through that and you know, majority of the Qur'anic collection that we have that's very old is almost 100 years after the Prophet. It's almost 100 years after the Prophet But in that collection where she saw Kufi script, writings of Qur'an, she saw some that looked a little bit different. So there were these 18, you can say, uh, skins of sheep or skins of lamb that had a little bit of a different writing. The way their script was written was different than the rest of the collection. So she wanted to do something with this, so they decided to carbon date it. They took it to Oxford University. Oxford University carbon dated it, and it came out to the time of the Prophet himself. Now, just as an introduction so that you understand this fully, how does carbon dating work? How do we do carbon dating? How does it work? The science of carbon dating, how does it work? Every living thing is carbon based. Every living thing has carbon in it. And we have two types of carbons within us. Two types of carbon elements within us. One is car called carbon 12. The other is called carbon 14. So what happens is carbon-12 is very stable. Carbon-12 does not lose its isotopes and its molecules over time. So if there's 100 atoms of carbon-12 10,000 years ago, there will still be pretty much 10, uh, whatever, 100, let's say 100 atoms of carbon-12 uh, 10,000 years ago, there will be 100 atoms of carbon-12 10,000 years later. But there's another carbon called carbon-14. Carbon-14 loses half of its molecules every 5,730 years. So every, so if there were, 
if there, if, let's say if you found a, 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 a skin of a lamb on which this Quran is written, and you carbon date it, you're going to look at two things, how many carbon 12s they are, and how many carbon 14s they are, how much the carbon 14 has reduced compared to the carbon 12 that gives you the average age. It's called half, what happens with carbon 14 is half life. So if 5,730 years have passed away, if there was 100 carbon 12 atoms, and there is 15, uh, not 15, 50 of the carbon 14 atoms, uh, 50 of the carbon 14 atoms, <coughs> that means approximately 5,730 years have gone by. So half of it. So they take these manuscripts and they carbon date them and they figure out that these manuscripts go back to the time of the Prophet ﷺ exactly. And like I said, if you want to, just Google uh, Birmingham Archive Quran Manuscript or Birmingham Quran Archive Manuscript and you'll find the university archives of these Quranic manuscripts that go back to the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Now why is this significant? It's very significant from an intellectual perspective because when you have a manuscript in your hand, you can't argue. There's no doubt when you have a manuscript from the time of the Prophet and you can compare it to the Quran of today, there is no doubt of any... I mean, either there will be complete doubt <coughs> because they don't match or there will be no doubt because they do match. There's going to be nothing in the middle. If even one word is off, it's a problem. And I'll tell you, personally, when I was going through, because there are 18 manuscripts, I've been through all 18 in general. And I spent about two, two weeks ago, a whole Saturday, I was up from Fajr time till maybe 12 o'clock, going through all of the 18 manuscripts. Then I took them one by one. It's been about two weeks now. I've been over four of the 18 manuscripts, going word by word by word by word. And I can tell you, that you know, I'm looking at the, the the manuscripts, and I see a word, and I'm reading Quran from my mind. I'm reading Quran from my mind, and I'm like, oh, this next word doesn't fit. I'm getting anxiety. Why does this not next word fit into what's in my brain? I look at the copy of the Quran, and it's there. Okay, like for example, I'll give you one example. Just today. Uh, we were. Uh, I was uh, translating a part of uh, the last few verses. I think it's the Nisa or Sulbaida. I have it here with me. And one of the words was kafa. But kafa is kafa, right? Kafa. But the way the author wrote it was kafa, yeah, which is the original. Kafa, yeah, is the original. So I saw the script with kafa and yeah, and I'm just. You know, because I'm like wondering, oh, what if, what if there's a slight error? What if there's a mistake? What will happen, right? So I'm looking at that one word. I'm like, ah, ah, and then I see this, yeah, and I'm like, why is that there? And I look at the copy, and it's there. So because I was only expecting kafa, ah, not the yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? So, and so I've been for, uh, through uh, four of these manuscripts. So now what I want to, now inshallah in my second khutbah I'll go into some more details about this manuscript and some of the interesting observations I made while uh, going through this manuscript that goes back to the time of the Prophet. I have the copies, if anybody wants to look at them, that's fine. I also have four of the uh, copies absolutely translated, meaning translated not in English, from Arabic to Arabic, but from the... Uh, script of the companions of the prophet to the script of today where you can look at it word to word and and have your own make up your own opinion about it inshallah i will continue my second khutbah <laughs> ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يدع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فلا يدر إلا نفسه أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 
إنا نحن نسألنا الذكر وإنا له لحافظون So some interesting observations that I want to make based upon what we know because we didn't have copies from the time of the Prophet till today we didn't have copies of the Quran from the time of the Prophet till today so the only way to know about what that what the Quran that they were writing at the time of the Prophet, the only way to have known was from books like Imam Sayyuti in his book Kitab al-Adkan or some of the ahadith that describe something about it being written and so on and so forth until the, today we had no knowledge or very little knowledge. So for example, one of the interesting things is that when we read the narrations of hadith and some of the books that have been written on the subject of how the Qur'an was compiled from, and again, my topic is not how the Qur'an was compiled. I'm only talking about this manuscript today. But when we look at the issue of, the issue of how the Qur'an was compiled, for example, our tradition does not tell us. And in fact, many ulama were in doubt. Because our tradition had said that between one surah and the next surah, there would be no Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. There would be no bismit, so between like for example Surah Nisa and Surah Al-Ma'idah or between Surah Al-Maryam and Surah Al-Taha There would be no Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim What we find in this manuscript is we have the ending of Surah Al-Maryam and the beginning of Surah Al-Taha and we have in the middle of it with decoration in a separate color of ink meaning the whole document is in black meaning the Sahaba, the companion of the Prophet who wrote this, wrote this in black but when he wrote Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, he wrote it in red. So we have two Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim between two surahs. The only, the only within the 18 collection that are like the beginning of a surah where you can observe this. In the same way, the ending of Surah Nisa to the beginning of Surah Al-Ma'idah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is written in red. And then after that, it is the writing, the rest of the surah is in black. So this is the first observation. We were not sure because many times, like for example, their narrations, their Umar radiallahu anh considered Surah Al-Feed and Surah Al-Quraysh as one surah. There are some narrations that some of the companions considered Surah Al-Tawbah and Surah Al-Yunus as one surah. So some of the people thought there must be no Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim between the surahs. But this manuscript of the Prophet sallallahu shows us, at the time, meaning a script from the time of the Prophet, that there was definitely a clear Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim from the time of the Prophet Number one. Number two, we have always heard that Hijaj bin Yusuf is the one that put the dots on the Qur'an. You probably heard this. But this is, now it seems like it's not completely 100% true. He probably formalized it. But if you look at this script, the Hijazi script from the time of the Prophet, they were definitely using dots from time to time. They were definitely, meaning it's not like the idea of dots was invented by Hijaj bin Yusuf. It was, pro it was probably there because we also know in our tradition, for example, when we learn the Arabic language, and particularly when we focus on the letters of Abjad, for example, those people that know the science of Abjad, they will tell you that the letters that have dots are weaker than the letters that don't have dots. So anyway, in terms of numerical strength, so... The, if, if it has two dots, it's weaker than if it doesn't have dots. If it has three dots, it's weaker than if it doesn't have, than compared to two dots. Anyway, my second point was that this original Hijazi, uh, the, uh, the, this original Quran from the time of the Prophet, it seems to have some dots. This is the second uh, observation that's very interesting. The third observation, which relates to the first observation, is that the tartib of the surahs, because the Orientalists have also also said that, well, okay, if the Quran is from the time of the Prophet, then uh, if the, I mean, if we if the Quran that you have is from the time of Uthman, but we don't know about the time of the Prophet, and they also say the order of the Quran, we don't know if the Prophet did it or if Uthman did it or the companions did it, who did it, but now it becomes clear because we have a copy of a fragment of the Quran from the time of the Prophet 
that clearly the ordering of the surahs was given by the Prophet ﷺ, as Imam Sayyidi had mentioned in his book, Kitab al Atkan, that the Prophet would say, put this verse here, and put this verse here, and put this verse here. So that's the other observation. The other observation is that when you look at this script, when you look at this 18 pages of script uh, from the university, you'll notice, again, we're coming towards the end of our time, you notice that different people, meaning there's more than one handwriting here. There's people that have very good handwriting here, and there's people that have okay handwriting here, and there's people that have very bad handwriting on these copies too. So, even from the time of the Prophet ﷺ, it becomes clear that there was not one scribe. There was what? Many scribes. And according to one of the narrations of Hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ used to dictate the Qur'an in Medina at least, up to 50 people at one time. With any verse, there would be up to 50 people writing down, and the Prophet would say, okay, repeat it back to me. Because you know when Abu Bakr ﷺ compiled the Qur'an, I don't know how many people know this, but he didn't compile the Qur'an based upon the Huffaz. He didn't say, okay, bring me ten Huffaz and have them recite Qur'an to me and we'll compile the Qur'an. That's not what happened. Let me just finish with some minor points that are very, very important. Number one, what did Abu Bakr do? In the house of the Prophet ﷺ, there was a copy of the Qur'an. The entire Qur'an was there. It was in the house of Aisha. Umar one had given it to his daughter, who was also the wife of the Prophet Hafsa, to take care of it. This Qur'an, that was a written Qur'an, in the house of the Prophet ﷺ, not asking the Hufaz to come, but he would ask for every single verse that they had in that copy. He would say, for every single verse, I want at least four people who have taken a direct dictation of the Prophet for this verse to show me that verse in their copy. So for example, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, the Prophet dictated it. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, somebody, four people wrote it down, the Prophet heard it from them. There's a separate copy in the house of Aisha, the Prophet Abu Bakr compared four people who took dictation from the Prophet to that copy that was in the house of Aisha. And he did this for the whole of Qur'an and there was only one verse of the Qur'an for which they couldn't find four testimonies. They found, uh, I think they found three, 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 three people for that ayah. I don't remember which ayah it is right now. And there's a very interesting story behind it which I'm not going to go into right now. But the point I'm trying to make is that the Qur'an had been commanded to be written from the first day. For example, in the first surah and the second surah revealed to Prophet Muhammad, Ikra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min ala, ikra wa rabbuka al-akram, alladhi allama bin qalam. He taught with the pen. The second surah, noon wal qalami wa ma yastuhun. Noon, and by the pen that they write. So the pen writing the Quran was mentioned in the second revelation to the Prophet. And there are many hadiths that you've also heard. Umar one when he was in Mecca, he, you know, he, when he hit his sister and all that, he got the copy of the Qur'an and read to the Taha. So it was being written from the early days. It's not like it was being written afterwards. They, you know, the Prophet came and he passed away and then the Muslims were struggling just to you know, compile the Qur'an and figure out where what goes and where each ayah goes. It wasn't like this. His whole purpose was to deliver the message of Qur'an. And he took great care of making sure that it was delivered properly. Um, I wanted to say a few more things, but I did, uh, I will, uh, I mean, time is running out, so what I'm going to do is, um, I'm just going to uh, maybe talk about this at some other time, because what I have to say next is going to take some time. So the point is that we have about one Jews worth of fragments of the Qur'an uh, from the time of the Prophet ﷺ that have now been scanned, the 
disseminated around the world. And by the way, just one interesting thing. So, you know, some of the Orientalists, and especially Robert Spencer, I don't know if you know who he is, but Robert Spencer, he owns the website called jihadwatch.com. I don't know if you ever, ever Googled anything about Islam, Jihad Watch always comes up as one of the main websites. So Robert Spencer, he said, oh, because you know when you carbon date something, it gives you a range, right? It doesn't tell you, oh, on this date. It gives you a range of 50 years or so. So that range goes about 10 years before the Prophet's life to about 10 years after the Prophet's life, right? So Robert Spencer and people in his likes, now they're saying, so, um, so now they're writing headlines like, Quran predates Muhammad. Quran now predates Muhammad. <laughs> so now they have to solve that. that. That leads into a bigger problem. Because if Quran predates Muhammad, then why does Quran say Muhammad Rasulullah ma'ahu? Why does it mention his name? And so, and so much of the events of the Quran that have to do specifically with his life. So anyway, the point is that, you know, there will always be, you can always argue anything. You can always argue anything. So, you know, I knew when this came out, I was like, because I've seen what happened with the, the, the manuscripts that were found in Sana. I don't know if you know about this. And Atlantic Monthly did a piece on it. And then what happened afterwards, there was a, there's a whole history of that. So I knew that when this Quran was discovered and everyone was so happy, and the professor, he's like, we're so, we're so shocked that we have a manuscript from, most likely from the time of the Prophet, this person must have known Muhammad, would have seen him preach. This is the university professor, one of them, saying this. And then I knew that it will be just a matter of time before someone comes up with something to say that tries to derail the whole uh, discussion. So what Robert Spencer has done is said, oh, well, it does predate Muhammad by 10 years or so. So maybe, even though what he didn't consider is that a lamb on average lives up to 15 years. So no matter, I mean, the lamb would have lived its life before they used the skin. So you've got 15 years that you have to also consider. Uh, anyway, the point is that uh, we should be happy. This is a good news for us that we have fragments of the Quran. They will be in display in one of the museums in, I forget the name of the museums, for about a month on October for everyone to see. I believe a lot of Muslims probably in England and France and other places are going to make special trips just to see this uh, manuscript. And, uh, and so I just wanted to share that with you because it does, it is an empirical fact. It is an empirical fact. And inshallah, if I get time, I'm going to have some sort of small exhibition here with the manuscripts that I translate too. Uh, but not translate, but uh, show uh, word to word how it's the same. And it's been quite an experience because, you know, as I've done this, and I'll leave this as a last point, as I'm doing this, you know, looking at every verse and then looking at the, the modern typescript with the, the goofy... Uh, the uh, the Hijazi uh, typescript of the times of the Prophet, and I'm thinking, wow, like this is the promise of Quran. It's true, meaning there will be another life. There, will, there, uh, th this is preserved. We have preserved this Quran, and if you look at, you know, people in the beginning writing Quran in a lambskin, lambskin. Writing Quran on a lambskin, what are the chances of preserving or not having a mistake in something like that? You know, lambskin, and I figured out, you know, it, 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 it takes about 20 goats or lambs to write one juz. Okay, so 20 times 30 would be how much? 600. So it would take 600 goats or sheep to write the whole Quran. And I don't know if you've ever seen the, the copy of Uthman, or the Allah, when his. It's very thick, it's very thick, so it makes sense. So, uh, inshallah, let's do dua and pray. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa fil adhaab anna. Rabbana ghulamna anfusana wa ilam taqfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunna min khasirin. Allahumma taj'al khilafat al-Muslimin fi hadhi al-Ard. Allahumma fil lana wa rhamna. Allahumma taj'al Qur'ana wa biya khulubina wa nura sunurina. Allahumma amini rabbil amin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ahli Muhammad. كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد إن الله يعمركم بالأذن والإحسان وإداء ذي القربة وينحى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي عنكم لعلكم تذكرون واذكروا الله يذكركم فاستجب لكم فأقيموا الصلاة